as the first submarine to enter service without the need for human muscle power in order to move, the plongeur, or diver, began a long, if slightly interrupted, tradition of homegrown French submarines, which makes France the only major naval power of the 19th century to not start out its submarine service with Holland-type submarines. It may surprise many that this operational, if somewhat short-range, submarine began life at the same time as the ironclad warship. The French Navy of the 1850s, which was undergoing one of its brief stints as the Imperial, as opposed to the National Navy, was very forward-thinking in its attempts to surpass the British as the top navy in the world. Elsewhere, this had shown itself off earlier with the Napoleon, the first purpose-built ship of the line with steam power, and at the end of the decade there was, of course, the construction of the ironclad Gloire, and as it turns out, a competition for a submarine. A French naval officer, improbably named Captain Bourgeois, had described a submarine capable of defending French ports against blockade by ironclads with a potential secondary use in cross-channel attacks. The design to these specifications by Monsieur Brun won the competition with the plans that would eventually become the Plongeur. Relatively long and spear-like, at least when viewed from the side, a feature characteristic of many French submarines up to the First World War, the unique element of this sub was that she was driven, as said, not by human power, but rather by compressed air. This explained her great size relative to other early submarines. At 420 tonnes on the surface and over 450 tonnes when submerged, much of her bulk was made up of the 23 large tanks holding the compressed air that she needed to move around. The only permanently dry part of the submarine was a relatively narrow corridor that ran down the middle between the tanks. The space between the hull plating and the tanks served as the ship's ballast tanks, and compressed air did pretty much everything on the sub. It drove the engines, it expelled water from the ballast tanks when the sub wanted to surface again, and rather cleverly, it also kept the crew constantly supplied with fresh air, as the exhaust from the compressed air engine was routed into the crew compartment. But this also meant the sub had certain limits. It wasn't supposed to dive below 40 feet, as the increasing pressure of water decreased the efficiency of the engine, and because the tanks were only rated to 180 psi, even the massive internal volume of the 23 tanks could only move the sub a total distance of 5 miles travelling at 4 knots, or 7.5 miles at a more pedestrian 2.4 knots, which meant an operational range that was limited to extremely close harbour defence, and assumed that there would be no adverse currents or tides. Uh, for comparison, the average modern scuba tank you can slap on your back contains compressed air at about 17 times the pressure of these early tanks. To refill the tanks, a small support ship, the Cachalot, had an air compressor installed and would follow the sub around. Of course, this being well before the invention of the Whitehead torpedo, the sub's offensive loadout was limited to a spar torpedo on the end of a very long stick mounted on the bow. Laid down in 1860 and launched in 1863, trials over the next couple of years showed that, although sound in principle, she was not actually a viable weapon in practice. Apart from the limited range, although she handled well on the surface, she was very difficult to control when underwater, as she lacked any hydroplanes, and so relied on the amount of water in her tanks to determine her horizontal stability. The fact that she only had one set of tanks for both ballast and trim, and the fact that as the compressed air was let out of her air tanks, her overall mass changed, made for something of a slow motion roller coaster ride for her crew. Just in case everything went wrong, a small lifeboat was included for her 12 man crew, and with typical French design flair, it was fared neatly into the spinal superstructure. But by the mid 1860s, it was concluded that it really wasn't worth continuing the trials. Bow planes had been suggested to fix the stability issues, but without any viable way to deal with the range problem, it just wasn't thought worth the effort, and so, after spending the last few years of that decade out of service, she was recommissioned in the 1870s as a steam water barge. 
with small conventional engines to power her water plant. This second lease in life meant that she actually ended up lasting far longer than submarines that were built decades after her. She wouldn't actually be decommissioned from that role until the end of 1935, and was then scrapped a couple of years later, having managed to outlive over 120 of her successors in French naval service. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.